Yeah, thank you for joining Rupert. Hello, good afternoon, Prash. Eight minutes. Yeah. Rupert,
So it's uh, 1 p.m. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, BioClues and BioServices and Genesis Clinicians Consortium of India, I welcome you all to this uh, August gathering. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sunil and uh, Niyaz, who are the chairs for our GCCI, the Genesis Clinician Consortium of India. I would like to uh, request Sunil to introduce uh, uh, the speaker for today. Uh, Rupert Hicker, please. Sunil, please. Over to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my privilege to invite Dr. Rupert uh, for this uh, on behalf of BioClues, BioServices, and GCCI. It's our privilege to invite Dr. Rupert. Uh, he's going to present on contextual tissue cytometry with AI immunophenotyping and uh, quantifying the tumor microenvironment in situ. So we'll be, uh, I want to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Rupert is co-founder of Tissue Gnostic Group in Austria, Romania, and USA. He is chief executive officer in uh, Tissue Gnostics, Austria, and uh, Romania, vice president of Tissue Gnostics in USA, as well as area manager of Tissue Gnostics China. And before founding Tissue Gnostics, he was a research scientist at Competence Center for Biomolecular Therapeutics in Vienna and joint venture between the University of Vienna and the Novartis Research Center. And uh, he's a co-inventor of the Tissue Facts Technology Report, has always been significantly involved in research and uh, product development from uh, system design to clinical testing. And uh, he has successfully headed several joint research projects and uh, with academic partner institutions in the fields of advanced computer vision, cancer research, stem cell biology, and personalized medicine. And uh, he's graduated from University of Vienna in cell biology. He has more than 20 years of experience in microscopy and image analysis. In addition, he has been trained in software development. So I invite uh, Dr. Rupa to uh, deliver his lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sunil, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brash, for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to um, present this afternoon about uh, tissue cytometry and its uh, applications, including um, applications that require artificial intelligence. A, I may um, want to add that uh, since October last year, I hold the position of a visiting fellow at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia, and this is where I'm based at the moment. So before we um, go deeper into the technology and the applications, it might be a good idea to make a step back and try to get the overview, what we are actually looking at, what we are doing. And in that sense, I would like to point your attention to this survey um, among 1,500 scientists, done, uh, pub, uh, which was published in uh, Nature in 2016. And following this survey, there was a, a, a global discussion um, also referred to as the reproducibility crisis. Namely, the result of this survey among 1,500 scientists was not uh, more and not less than the fact that 70% of the researchers reported to have problems in reproducing published data. And, and another 20% uh, reported that they have even problems in reproducing their own data. So the question is, are our published data in science only reliable to 10%, which uh, sounds not very promising. Um, so following this survey, a call was raised for, for actually three items, action items. First, a better mentorship. This is something universities have to take care of. Second, the proper use of statistics. This is something each individual uh, laboratory or principal investigator has to take care of. And third, more ro robust experimental designs. This is something where companies like Tissue Gnostics 
uh, can come in. There is, in fact, a number of um, well-established technologies that can be used in order to quantify cellular markers, on both on the protein as well as on the mRNA or DNA level. One such technology that has been available for decades is flow cytometry. Um, if you go to public medline and search for this term, flow cytometry or FAX, you will literally find hundreds of thousands of publications. Flow cytometry offers a phenotypic and functional analysis of cells by quantifying immunofluorescence mediated antibody staining on the single cell level. One major limitation to flow cytometry is that it can only be applied to cells in suspension. That's why it's called flow cytometry. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of tissue in the human body is not liquid, as we are all aware of, but uh, it's solid. So you cannot analyze solid tissue sections in a flow cytometer, at least not in a proper way. The alternative technology that can be used for uh, tissue sections on glass slides is image cytometry. This requires a slide scanner, scanning and digitalization of the slides. And then you can do the same type of phenotypic and functional analysis, just that the individual cells are now not in a cell suspension, but in a tissue section. And what I will refer to in this presentation is tissue cytometry by the tissue fax. This is uh, the instrument and the way image cytometry uh, is offered in by tissue gnostics by my company. So uh, who is tissue gnostics? Um, as it was mentioned during the introduction, I'm actually a cell biologist. As part of my PhD thesis, I'm developed the prototype of tissue fax at the Medical University of Vienna. And we, in 2003, the company was founded. So in three weeks from now, we will actually celebrate our 18th anniversary. The headquarter is located in the city of Vienna in Austria, so in the center of Europe. We have international uh, subsidiaries and offices in Romania, Los Angeles, uh, Massachusetts, um, Tissue Gnostics Asia Pacific is a registered company in Hong Kong and has offices in Beijing, Taipei and Brisbane. What I would like to uh, point your attention to is the fact that uh, we have now a list of reference publication, research groups from more than 60 countries on all continents have published almost 1,700 scientific publications using our technology. And uh, the company is also certified for ISO 13485, which is the main quality norm for medical products. And this has uh, been so since 2008. We are working under the scope or call it the umbrella of personalized medicine, which is also called or referred to as precision medicine. The overall idea of precision medicine is that we accurately determine the cause of a certain disease. It's mostly related to cancer, but not limited to cancer, and understand the molecular mechanism which leads to a certain um, transformation or mutation in a patient rather than applying standard therapies, right? Nowadays, standard therapies are applied and the doctors subsequently see that that did not work. And then the next standard therapy comes. The idea of precision medicine is to first determine the exact molecular mechanism which has led to a specific cancer, form of cancer, in a specific individual patient, and then choose the therapy, the matching therapy, based for the mechanism working in that patient. And to do so, we need instruments, software, and technologies that allow to elucidate and to quantify such molecular mechanisms. In other words, we need to quantify proteins, but also genetic markers like RNA or DNA on the single cell level in tissue section. And this is the scope of tissue gnostics. And to reach this scope and always stay at the forefront of scientific research of technology, 
Um, we have been collaborating uh, with a number of um, academic institutions across the world, but I would like to mention in particular five major multi-million euro EU funded um, Marie Curie innovative training networks, which dealt with um, uh, digital pathology that was led by um, a university the Castilla La Mancha in Ciudad Real in Spain. Then the CASA Biomedicine Network, which focused on the calcium sensing receptor as a potential target of therapeutic in intervention. This molecule plays uh, an important role in a number of diseases, not only cancer, but also breast cancer or diabetes, asthma and Alzheimer's disease. Then uh, there was Alcatraz, Break Free from Cancer, a translational oncology network headed by University of Cambridge in UK. INSEM, the European Network on Cell Migration Studies. And uh, those four projects have already finished. Currently uh, ongoing is Helical, um, the Marie Curie project on big data analysis by machine learning for clinical benefit headed by Trinity College in Dublin. The common denominator for all those projects for tissue diagnostics was the need to have image cytometry solutions at highest level. And this is what we have pre uh, prepared on, and also developed in the course of these projects. Now, what is, why is it so important um, to quantify? I mean, all of us can look through a microscope and make a statement, like something is bright or not bright, or uh, there is much or not much. But this is not what this is all about. Please have a look here on this um, slide. You will see there are different regions uh, in different gray values. And when we look at them, we see there are some are brighter, some are darker. Now, when we look on A and B, my question to you now is, what do you think, what's the difference in terms of gray values? When we say gray value zero is black and gray value 255 is white. So what's the difference between A and B? The human eye will never be able to say the difference is 37, right? But I have prepared here five answers no difference, I'm sorry, this is an automatic moving, uh, no difference, smaller equal 20, 50, 100. Please guess what you think. The next slide shows, in fact, they're identical. It's hard to believe, but we can see here, it's in fact true. It, there is, this is an optical illusion. It comes from the fact that this area is surrounded by brighter, while this area is surrounded by even darker areas. And therefore, we have the impression they are different, but they are not. And to be able to quantify for on the single cell level how much of a certain molecule is present, that is what is tissue cytometry all about, similar to flow cytometry. And just to, to give you an idea how the instruments that tissue diagnostics has developed look like, there are different versions, like here, Stratafax 2, uh, which uh, supports bright field scanning of two slides. Or the main product that we have is called Tissuefax. This is, our, is a family of products, um, which is also available for bright field only, fluorescence only, or the combination thereof. And it's called Tissuefax Plus. As you can see, this is based on a high-end microscope of Carl Zeiss. So Tissue Gnostics is OEM partner of Carl Zeiss Germany. Um, it supports any kind of objective lens from 2.5x to 100x, including oil immersion. So automated scanning of the slides. The immediate result of this scanning process is what is generally referred to as the virtual slide. We can see here an entire mouse leg so please note that this is not the picture taken with a webcam. This is the result of a scanning procedure at high resolution. Many individual fields of view are acquired and then brought together. There is, they are acquired with overlap and neighboring fields of view are stitched. Pixel, that means pixel-wise matched so that this virtual slide 
is visible. Like with Google Earth, we can navigate through the sample and zoom in to see the cellular or even subcellular details, like here in this into the bone. It works um, for all kinds of tissues, like also here we have um, uh, fine needle aspirates or biopsies of prostate and also in fluorescence. What we see here is a tissue section stained with four markers of a prostate, uh, prost a prostate cancer. We see here the individual glands in the t uh, of the prostate section with the lumen. Here is actually a prostate stone or some sand. Yeah. In red, we see a marker uh, cytokeratin. This is uh, labels the secretory epithelial cells. Here in green, the basal layer are the secretory. The, the, these are the basal epithelial cells, and in orange is a marker that uh, is a kind of tumor marker which shows. In, at an early stage, malignant transformation. The absence of a basal cell layer and the presence of this marker on the secretory epithelial cells indicates on the functional level malignant transformation and that this is actually a prostate cancer. Also morphologically, we, when we just look on H and E, we might not recognize this. Again, we can zoom in here, then we start seeing the individual Nuclei in blue, this is uh, stained by DAPI, a nuclear marker, and even further than the details of individual glands, where we can really see individual cells, and those cells can be analyzed. And this is what the focus of my presentation is about. Just to complete the overview of the product the pipeline, we also have um, inverted systems, referred to as tissue fax I, I like inverted, where you can also scan slides by putting them upside down or well plates. This can be combined with uh, culture chambers so that also live cell imaging, time kinetic experiments and even um, as of, and, and functional experiments in cell cultures can be made. For high throughput scanning, we have um, a slide loader that can automatically scan up to 120 slides. And each configuration of our product, uh, of our, each fluorescence configuration of our product line can be equipped with a spinning disk confocal to provide whole slide confocal imaging. Uh, we see here an example of a mouse brain section. So this is a section through an entire mouse brain. Uh, this is an example we received from Janelia Farm Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in USA. The rectangles, the individual rectangles that you see here are the individual fields of view uh, acquired at using a 20x objective lens. In order to acquire the entire sample, 350 fields of view have to, had to be scanned. Each field of view contains four color channels, DAPI plus three antibodies. In order uh, to scan the entire tissue section in a single focal plane, it takes 8.5 minutes. If you make a set stack, that means one focal, the main focal plane plus 10 additional levels above and 10 below. So in total, 21 layers, each layer consisting of 350 fields of view, each field of view consisting of four channels, that gives in total 29,400 images or 115 gigabyte of data. This is automatically done, including autofocus and storing in 1.5 hours. So this is still very fast. If you try to do this manually by moving the scanning stage always to the next position and then acquire 29,400 images, you will probably sit a few weeks and not 1.5 hours. Again, like uh, discussed before, we can use this virtual slide to navigate through our digital sample, through our image data set, like in Google Earth, and then zoom in in order to see the cellular or even subcellular details. This is another example um, of a mouse brain section, which uh, I received from uh, Jacobs University in Bremen in Germany. When we look into and zoom into this region, we see it's, it's called the uh, third ventricle. You see here the, the level of the, um, the 
de the detail, the degree of detail that is visible. Uh, you can scan the entire brain if you want at this uh, magnification. You will have a huge data set, but it, you can then zoom in and see the details, zoom out and have the overview. And this is all done on the same data set. Now, I have mentioned that tissue fax is based on a, uh, um, the hardware. The core of the hardware is a high-end Zeiss microscope from Carl Zeiss, Germany. Difference between a Zeiss microscope with image analysis software and a tissue fax cytometer. There are two main differences. The first one is the workflow that we have designed and the degree of automation. The second one is the quality of the image analysis, in particular the segmentation. And this comes with this flow cytometry like data handling. Now, what is segmentation? Um, I would like to explain this uh, to this uh, audience. We see here two examples. They have nothing to do with uh, cell uh, um, identification, but a lot with segmentation. The computer, computers are great in handling images, but not so great in understanding what an image shows. In order to do so, we have to apply algorithms which find groups of pixels that belong together. And these, the algorithms create so-called measure masks, which identify which part of an image is one object, which is another object. And this is the art, the very art of tissue gnostics to automatically identify single cells in tissue context, even when the cells are very dense and touching each other, which is the usual uh, situation in tissue. Here you see that up to um, 20 markers, uh, sorry, up to 20 parameters are available per marker. There are intensity related or shape related uh, parameters. The analysis options that are available are uh, called HistoQuest, which is uh, histological analysis, single cell analysis in histological samples, TissueQuest, single cell analysis um, in fluorescence, and our high end solution for contextual tissue cytometry is called StrataQuest. Now, let's go into detail and give you an overview of the applications that are possible. Quantification of nuclear markers is a basic application that we always need. We see here a standard staining of a column with um, in an immunohistochemistry peroxidase staining protocol. In blue, we have the nuclei. In brown, we have a mar well-known marker called KI67, a proliferation marker. It tells us how many cells are currently proliferating in this tissue. This is, for example, important in um, in many in tumor diagnostics in oncology and this is used as the so-called proliferative index now normally people look at this and estimate or and may say you know 10 percent or 30 percent of, of cells are brown positive so are proliferating we have also done our own survey among, among roughly 200 scientists and asked them how many cells are proliferating. In other words, how many blue nuclei are also brown? And the answer that we received ranged, the answers ranged from 1% to 40%. So which is a pretty big difference, if we are honest, right? This is an example of a very good illustrative example of visual evaluation and the main problems associated with visual evaluation. We always get a range of estimations rather than a reproducible measurement. When we analyze this sample with our tissue fax platform, then we use the nuclear marker, so the hematoxylin, the blue stain, as a master channel. And the yellow contours here show you what the software has recognized as individual nucleus. And then we quantify for each nucleus how much brown and how much blue or whatever color is present. In this case, it's brown and blue. How much of each color is associated with each cell? And this is shown in such a scattergram, or people in flow cytometry call it a dot plot. 
where on the x-axis we show the mean intensity of the blue staining and on the y-axis the mean intensity of the brown staining, so KS67. This line here is famous in flow cytometry, it's called the cutoff and it determines the level of specificity in our staining. Only cells with a staining intensity greater than the cutoff, in this case 20, will be referred to as positive. So we see here our positive population and below the cutoff our negative cells. And we also see that this 14.5% uh, of all cells which are KS67 positive. Obviously, this number or this percentage depends on where you set the cutoff. So theoretically, you can generate any number that you want, but the question is, how do you have to set the cutoff? Well, there is an, a scientifically well-established method, also used in flow cytometry, and this is called the isotype-matched negative control. So you have to use a separate tissue section where you apply an isotype antibody and you set and acquire under same conditions like your test samples and based on this isotype you set your cutoff and then apply the same settings to your um, samples under investigation. Then you can compare the results. And this way you have an observer independent and quantitative result on the single cell basis. And whether you do the analysis on Monday morning, on Wednesday noon, on Friday afternoon, in uh, India, in Australia, in Austria, um, you will always get the same result rather than a wide range of estimation that depends on who does the analysis and maybe at what time of the day, in the morning, in the evening, uh, if you're tired or if you're stressed or whatever. So observer-independent quantification replaces observer-biased estimation. Now, this was the first example of nuclear analysis. What happens if our molecule is not expressed in the nucleus, or not only in the nucleus, but also, or maybe only in the cytoplasm, which we see here. This is an example from skin cancer research. We see here two biopsies. The first one is a biopsy of normal skin, and the second biopsy was taken after UV radiation, so after sun bathing. The marker under investigation is called COP1, but that's irrelevant. We're talking not about the biology, but about the methodology to quantify these cells. And what we see here is that this marker is constitutively expressed in the epidermis, but after UV radiation, the amount of positive cells and also the, the amount per cell increases by this brighter staining and by more cells being positive. Normally people would look at this and say this is one plus positive and this is two plus positive and then maybe your colleague comes and says well I would call this three plus positive and then you discuss and in the end you design it's 2.5 plus positive. Rather than discussing how many pluses you assign to a certain sample, tissue cytometry will give you, again, an observer-independent measurement. We see here the sample of normal skin and here after UV irradiation. And what we see at the glance is that the number of positive cells increases from 16.8 to 447 so on the left-hand side, we have normal. On the right-hand side, we have the biopsy after UV irradiation. But what we also see is that the positive population in the UV irradiated sample shows a shift towards higher value, values. So what we visually perceive as brighter in this image is reflected here in a quantitative manner. This cutoff, again, comes from the negative control that we see here. This sh uh, sh uh, shows the level of autofluorescence or uh, unspecific binding of the antibody, if any, occurs. And the insert, which is known as quadrant statistic, gives you uh, the statistic of the... So this, this is the cutoff for the parameter shown on our x-axis, which is the intensity of the DNA marker. And this is the cutoff for the parameter on our y-axis, which is COP1, the mean intensity of this antigen under investigation. These two parameters 
sorry, these two cutoffs separate our diagram into four quadrants, the upper left, the upper right, the lower left, and the lower right. And this is reflected to here in this quadrant statistic. We see there are in total 759 cells in this upper left quadrant. Out of 1,697 cells which are present in total in this region analyzed, and this represents 44.73% of the cells being positive for a marker. One of the features that our client or clients around the world appreciate most is the ability to track back and forth individual cells from virtual slide to data space. So we have here, uh, for example, a renal allograft rejection. Um, the cells in green are T cells, in red are monocytes. And if we click on the green cell, we see it's blinking here, green positive, red negative. If we click on the red cell, it's green negative, red positive. So red is monocyte. Following our motto from image to analysis, we consider this a step forward and therefore call it the forward connection from image to data space. It also works the other way around from data space back to the image. We can like here define a gate, which is a selection of a subpopulation of cells and then highlights the content of this gate here in a specific color. So you can visualize where in the tissue section a certain subpopulation of cells is located. That means you get the con con uh, connection between the phenotype and histology. The system not only tells you how many cells are there and how many express a specific marker or a specific marker combination, so co-expressions can be determined, but also where the cells with a certain phenotype are located in the tissue section. Um, many, especially uh, people working in histology or pathology, are very used to looking at samples in uh, the typical immune histochemistry format, that means in transmission microscopy. Therefore, we have introduced the, what we call the pseudo IHC view. We see here a fluorescent samples with four colors. And we can convert, digitally convert, a fluorescence image into an immunohistochemistry image. So it looks like it was a peroxidase staining. It's actually DAPI, but it looks like uh, hematoxylin. <coughs> then we add our green marker, our red marker, and our the fourth here in, in uh, this uh, bluish uh, here, the, it's a cytokeratine. So it is in fact a fluorescence image, but it's shown like it was an immunohistochemistry, so a bright field microscopy or transmission sample. And in fact, there is a fifth marker called SP red, but there are only two cells here and here, which are yellow. This is the original image. This is the pseudo-IHC pseudo -IHC view. A very important application of tissue cytometry is the ability that we can determine the immune status in a specific organ or in a specific tissue. With flow cytometry, we can determine the immune status systemically in blood. With tissue cytometry, we can determine the immune status in a specific tissue environment, in situ. This is also referred to as the phenotypic characterization of tissue infiltrating leukocytes. We see here an example which I received from University of Western Australia in Perth. It's a colorectal cancer stained for four markers, DAPI, T helper cells, cytotoxic T cells in red, and FOXP3. You may know that CD4 and FOXP3 double positive cells are referred to as the regulatory T cells. So yellow and green double positive are T regs, regulatory T cells. Like explained before, we use the nuclear signal, the DAPI, as a master channel. And the green contours here show you what the system has automatically recognized as individual cell. 
So it is not that there's somebody sat there and draw the circles. This is all done automatically by the computer. And based on this segmentation result, automated recognition of individual cells, we can now measure how many cells are CD4 positive. This we see here, and in red, the backward connection. So there are some cells which have a lot of yellow, so a, a, a intense staining of CD4. They will be somewhere up here because this axis shows CD4, and the further up a dot is, the more of the molecule of CD4 is present. Others have only a little bit of CD4, so a little bit of yellow. They will be somewhere close to the cutoff, but still above the cutoff, means still be referred to as positive. And all the cells with green contours are below the cutoff, so they do not have a specific staining of CD4, of yellow, and are therefore referred to as CD4 negative. We can do the same thing for CD8. And finally, for CD4 and FOXP3, double positive cells, right? We again have these, these two cutoffs. This is the cutoff for the CD4 marker. This is the cutoff for our FOXP3. And this gives us four um, quadrants. Here, the FOXP3 single positive. Here, the CD4 single positive. Here, the double positive and here the double negative cells. And the system tells you exactly how many cells in percentage, in total count or in density, cells per square millimeter of tissue analyzed are in which quadrant, so have which phenotype. Now, we have seen that we can analyze molecular markers, proteins on single cell levels, be it in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. We can also analyze uh, subcellular components or structures inside the cell, like, for example, um, fish fluorescence in cytohybridization or RNA scope. I would like to show you here, however, um, an example which is might be of interest in particular for uh, India, which is uh, intracellular parasites. Yeah? It's the case, the example of leishmaniasis. Uh, this is, um, has been developed in collaboration with the Institute of Immunology in Regensburg in Germany. I'm not going to talk about the biology of Leishmaniasis, but about the methodology to detect the parasites intracellular. So um, Leishmanias are um, protozoan parasites which are transmitted by a mosquito and infect certain cells like macrophages where they multiply. Patients suffering from this disease encounter really severe structural tissue damage. Now, in this in Regensburg in Germany, the group of uh, Professor Ritter uh, is working on a cure for Leishmaniasis. And they used our inverted tissue fuck system in well plates, in cultures of um, macrophages to quantify the effect of treatment using different agents. What we see here is one virtual well, not a virtual slide, because we are working in a micro well plate. So this is one well of a 20 well plate. The individual rectangles highlighted here are uh, the individual fields of view that had to be acquired in order to cover a full well. When we zoom in, we see here um, the, the blue dots, which are the big ones, are the nuclei of the macrophages, and the smaller dots here are the nuclei of the intracellular parasites, the Leishmanias. Yeah. Now, we first used the DAPI stain, the, uh, the nuclear signal of the macrophages, to identify all the macrophages. And then, for each macrophage, we generate a so-called ring mask around the nucleus, which we see here. This is done for all the cells. And inside this ring mask, we look for the dots for smaller dots for the nuclei of the parasites. Now, this algorithm is a mathematical procedure. It does not obviously really understand what the parasite is. It works with groups of pixels, uses intensity or texture parameters. So we, we need to fine tune the algorithm and set its sensitivity. We, in the lower panel here, we see the control population uh, without Lashmania major. So all the yellow dots we see here are in fact false positive. The algorithm here is too sensitive. 
we use this culture, this control, in order to set the sensitivity of the algorithm so that nothing is detected, because there are no parasites in this control. And then the same settings are applied to our test samples, which contain the parasites. And what the algorithm finds now, these are really the parasites. In this publication, um, 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 comparison with manual counting was done, showing a very good correlation. We have also developed an in, a detailed algorithm which is able to separate here touching cells. And this is in partic of particular relevance for tissue, because in tissue, neighboring cells always touch each other, by definition, otherwise it would not be tissue. So, and if, if we have here, an, because a lack between these two cells, as we can see here, is a lack of contrast, and the primary segmentation algorithm did not succeed, succeed to segment here two objects, but identified one doublet, a double cell. With a special uh, detail algorithm, we close such gaps and in the end are able to segment two separate cells and then count inside each cell how many parasites are there. And because there are two stains um, for the parasites, one which labels all nuclei and from the second stain, which only labels dead nuclei, we can see that those which are labeled in green are the living parasites and those which are red and green double positive are the dead parasites. So with this methodology, we can not only identify single cells and parasites, but also determine parasites, intra intracellular parasites per single cell, but also determine how many parasites are alive and how many are dead, which is crucial in order to uh, assess the effect of treatment. So, um, nobody of us has missed that we are living in a pandemic world. So I would also like to uh, tell you that with our tissue cytometry uh, platform, we have already uh, supported virology research in many ways, not only since uh, Corona, but already before. Like we see here an example of influenza and pneumonia, which could be a one-to-one -one copy paste story for COVID. But this is influenza. And you see here um, that the viral load of parenchymal cell, of, of epithelial cells in, the, in lung parenchyme was quantified. So in red, uh, we have the epithelial cells, and green is virus. So we can determine the viral load, how many cells, how many epithelial cells are actually infected, and how much of the virus is there. And in another application, or in another publication rather, uh, Zika virus was analyzed. And here, individual virus particles were quantified per single cell. Or dengue virus. And with this application, I would like to uh, emphasize what we see here, that with this tissue cytometry approach, we can not only quantify markers uh, which are expressed on 50% of all cells, no, we can look, we can really work uh, and look into minor cell populations, right? You see here 0 0.06, 1.39, 0.55% of all cells are positive for this uh, dengue, dengue virus. So <clears throat> it's a very detailed and in depth analysis which is on the single cell level, in situ, and quantitative. I mentioned at the beginning that um, tissue agnostics, and not only tissue agnostics, but uh, is working in under the scope or in this uh, or umbrella of precision medicine. Precision medicine is probably one of the current mainstreams for medicine into the 21st century. And as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, precision medicine requires that we understand molecular mechanisms. Now, in order to understand molecular mechanisms, it's not sufficient to look at one marker because cells, phenotypes, functions of cells are usually determined by a set of markers. And the more research we do, the more markers we need. So we need, we, we need to look for strategies how we can increase 
the, the number of markers that we can analyze per single cell. And one of the strategies that has been developed, not by tissue agnostics, but is also supported by our uh, instrument platform, is multiplexing. In multiplexing, we take a, a given tissue section, stain it with a certain combination of antibodies and fluorochromes, make, image it, scan it, and then remove the staining and restain the same tissue section with the same combination of fluorochromes. But in each staining round, the fluorochromes represent different markers. And subsequently, these images are aligned and registered. Registration is the term for aligning images into one stack so that we can analyze them at the same time. In this publication from Yale University, um, this process has been described using our TissueFax platform and StrataQuest software uh, for this registration and cross-correlation and then obtaining a uh, very detailed analysis on the single cell level. We see here that like CD4, KI67, Grandsign B, Interleukin 6, FOXB3, and other markers have been quantified, but the cells that you see here in, the, in, in all the figures from A to L, this is always the same cell population on the same tissue section, right? With some 10 markers stained, not simultaneously, but in a cyclic way using this multiplexing approach. Another a technical approach to increasing the number of biomarkers or molecules that can be imaged and quantified simultaneously on the same tissue section, on the same cell population, is multispectral imaging. So a minute ago, we talked about multiplexing, which requires a standard fluorescence microscope and a cyclic staining and subsequent alignment of the individual images. In multiplex, in, in multispectral imaging, all markers up to 10 are applied at the same time and acquired by specific uh, acquisition technology, which includes a liquid crystal tunable filter that allows to detect a lambda stack. When we talked uh, at the beginning of this presentation about a confocal microscope, we talked about the set stack, which is um, and where in a set stack, you look on a given sample, a given region in different focus position. In a lambda stack, you look at the given sample in the same focus position, but in different spectral intervals. And by using a mathematical procedure referred to as spectral unmixing, the computer can calculate how much of the total spectral emission comes from fluorochrome 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, up to 10. And then we get here a very nice and clear and brilliant picture. And one very uh, um, current and relevant, currently relevant application is shown in this uh, cell paper from uh, Harvard University in Boston where the immune response against the SARS-CoV-2 virus was quantified in situ in um, COVID-19 patients. So in the lung tissue of COVID-19 patients, and there was a, a seven color immunostaining. I, I don't have the time to go into the details, but the, anyhow, it's, it's a published paper, so you can always uh, refer to it. And the unmixing was done using by spectral imaging using our tissue fax spectra platform. And uh, just to make this, the, the long story short, uh, this, there is, this research had a rather unfortunate outcome for the whole world, unfortunate for the whole world. It actually showed there was the first indication last year that the concept of herd immunity against Corona will not work because the SARS-CoV-2 virus tricks our immune system and avoids the formation of germinal centers. In other words, um, prevents the formation of long-term immunity. And this is also what they have, what the authors of this paper 
um, is the main conclusion. Yeah? Now, in, we are well into the 21st century, into the age of computers. And of course, uh, computers, computer assisted diagnostics, for example, has also uh, played an ever in more important role in our research and in our medical diagnostics. And in fact, tissue cytometry also offers uh, solutions for machine learning or deep learning. For example, in our latest generation, which is called TissueFox Suite 7, we have a new segmentation algorithm which is based on deep learning. And this is especially important when you work with lymphatic tissue, where you often have extremely dense cellular conditions like we see here. Uh, this is PAPI only, and you can see that the cell, the nuclei are actually almost touching or effectively touching each other or overlaying each other. And this is a very, very challenging situation for the computer, sometimes even for a trained human observer to see what is one cell and what is a neighboring cell. With this deep learning algorithm, we can uh, obtain a really impressive result in the automated acquisition. Machine learning and or classification is often used to identify certain histological structures, like here in this key section, seven classes are defined, including the epidermis, uh, the dermis, or the uh, subcutaneous fat. And based on this, on this classification, further cellular analysis, as I have shown before, can be obtained. Now, we have seen that we can analyze I identify individual cells, the nucleus, the cytoplasm, subcellular compartments or multicellular structures, all in an automated manner. Now we can combine this in order to establish a contextual image cytometry. Again, we see here a colorectal cancer. We identify all the nuclei. In orange, we see the measure mask for the tumor region. And then we can combine these measure masks and ask all kinds of questions. In this case, this research group from Perth has asked the question, how many CD4 positive cells, so T helper cells, are present? Where are they? Are they inside the tumor or in the tumor stroma? If they're in the tumor stroma, how far are they away from the next tumor area? And how many of the CD4 positive cells are also FOXP3 double positive, so are regulatory T cells? We see here a scattergram in which CD4 was used as an input gate. On the x-axis, we have the size of the nuclei, and on the y-axis, the distance in micrometer from the next tumor area. So each dot that you see here represents a CD4 positive cell. And the gate, or the position on the y-axis, indicates the distance in micrometer from the next tumor region. So we can make here gates, which contain all the cells which are 1 to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 100, and so on, micrometers away. The quadrant statistic shows us that we have in total 7,234 cells, and 2,267 thereof, or 31.3 percent, are in the first gate, which indicates a distance of 1 to 25 micrometer. Now we can use this backward connection feature that I've introduced earlier to visualize here. In orange, we see the tumor area, and in red, we see those and only those cells which are CD4 positive are immediately outside the tumor and not further away than 25 micrometers. Or here, 25 to 50, 50 to 100, and so on. So we get a very detailed analysis in spatial context. And we can use this in order to, de to analyze what is, is called the tumor microenvironment in situ, on the single cell level, in a quantitative manner. So these distance zones can also be shown uh, directly in the tissue in the in, in form of color regions, color areas overlaid. And then from those data, you can make, you can generate such graphs like which shows the cytotoxic T cells, the effector T cells, and the regulatory T cells, and how many are inside the tumor or outside the tumor in the tumor stroma in a certain distance. So you get a very detailed 
analysis on the single cell level. Uh, here again, we have a seven color immunostaining. It's one of those immune checkpoint uh, com marker combinations uh, acquired with spectral imaging. This is the original image. After spectral unmixing, we get a very clear and brilliant um, image of this uh, tumor. Here you see the individual uh, regions, so the individual channels. And, uh, here, this would be the overlay of all channels. Click on any of the cells, you will see it blinking in all the scattergrams. So you know exactly where that cell is located in your data space. And this would be um, the data set for the, uh, the backward connection for, the, for each of the cell populations. I don't have the time to go here into too much details, but I would like to finally, as a last example, explain this to you. In the first scattergram here, we see the size of the cells and the PDL1 mean intensity. And here in this gate in green, we see the PDL1 positive cells. We now choose this gate as an input gate for our second scattergram. All the cells visible in the second scattergram only come from this gate. In other words, all the cells here are PDL1 positive. The markers shown on the second scattergram are CD4 and PD1. If we, and we have here our four scattergrams as discussed earlier. If we now look on the double negative quadrant here, so CD4 negative, PD1 negative, and use this as an input gate on our third scattergram. That means we see here only those cells which are CD4 negative, PD1 negative, and PDL1 positive, because this was the input gate there in the second scattergram. And the lower left quadrant of the second scattergram is the input gate in our third scattergram. As the lower left quadrant is the input gate in our third scattergram. And when we now look again on the uh, double negative here, which is um, CD8 and C on the x-axis and CD68 on the y-axis, and make the backward connection, then we see here in red those cells which are PDL1 positive, CD4 negative, PD1 negative, CD8 negative, and CD68 negative. So we have one, two, three, four, five markers analyzed, co expression of five markers analyzed on the single cell level in situ, in a tissue section. To conclude my presentation, um, I would like to mention that this uh, system has been um, analyzed in many ways, also the, the, the quality of the data. The first one was a, a publication done by myself and our group back in, in 2006, already published in cytometry here. Um, as a, the, the tissue fax is the name of the instrument. The name of the technology is microscope-based multicolor tissue cytometry, MMTC. And we combined here, uh, co compared here MMTC versus standard fax using peripheral blood glucosides stained for a standard uh, CD3, CD4, CD8 marker combination, and then compared the results showing a very good correlation coefficient on peripheral blood glucosides between standard flow cytometry and tissue cytometry. The group in Perth, from which I have shown already data earlier, has also done a, such a comparison by manually counting FOXP3 positive cells in tissue sections of colorectal cancer. Three observer manually counted defined regions. Um, as you can see, and as, as was to be expected, um, each observer had a different output. That's very normal. This is what we showed earlier, the problem with manual evaluation. The, me the median of the three observers was used to compare with the software obtained results. And this gives also a very high correlation coefficient between manual counting, which you can refer to as the gold standard, and um, automated analysis. Just that the difference is that the manual counting was done on a few small regions, while the uh, automated analysis can be done on full samples with millions of cells in less time than the manual counting can be done in small regions. 
So I hope that with this presentation I could give you an overview and show that you can use tissue cytometry um, to move from image to data and increase the observer independence and reproducibility. I would like to uh, thank, uh, well, I have already mentioned our, our reference publications. Um, I invite you to go to our website, tissuegnostics.com, uh, under research, you will find a searchable database uh, where you can look on which marker, on which disease, on which tissue type. Um, any more, anybody somewhere in the world has already worked using this technology. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge and thank our partners from academia, from our EU projects, uh, but also um, our consultant from Brazil and, and our partner here, Professor Jots Nabatra from um, Queensland University of Technology, with whom I am closely collaborating. And finally, um, I would like to thank you. I hope I could show you that with tissue cytometry, you can explore the fundamental unit of life, cells, at the precision that inspires. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent talk, Rupert. Yeah, thank you so much. So the forum is uh, open for Q&A session. Nayaz and I will uh, uh, take you through uh, questions, if any. Yeah. Yeah, please feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute your microphone. Yeah, and interact. Yeah. You also see my email address here. So you feel free to contact me anytime also later on if you have questions or needs. Thank you, Rupert, for a wonderful session. Uh, to explain very nicely, briefly, about all the techniques that have been used. And uh, so how does the AA platform uh, is helpful in uh, looking to the tissue biopsies, like uh, tissue biopsies, A platform? Is there any methodology that can be developed for it? Uh, looking to the tissues and fluid biopsies? Yes, so we, you can work with, uh, with biopsies or um, solid tissue sections, also large tissue sections, uh, fine needle aspirates, uh, cell cultures, and the comparison can be done um, using machine learning techniques, even on H and E, like finding tumor regions or measure the size of tumor areas or on, on cellular mark, on the level of cellular markers, either in bright field imaging, in fluorescence, as we have seen multiplexing, uh, multispectral, confocal imaging, all those technologies are supported in order to uh, quantify uh, cellular subpopulations in all those kinds of, of tissue sections, including biopsies. Thank you. Yeah, Rupert, and I was just wondering, you know, how uh, cost effective uh, this would be, say, 10 years down the line? If we really look into, say, the histogenetics perspective, I mean, uh, could we could we really uh, see any uh, costs, you know, coming uh, uh, down? Uh, NGS or single cell uh, analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, something that is, is currently um, in fact, ongoing, we see there is a trend towards digital pathology. And um, although we have to distinguish, when most people, when they talk about digital pathology today, they refer to slide scanning. The actual analysis by pathologists is still done visually, just that the pathologists look on the slide on their monitor rather than through the ocular of a microscope. What, uh, what we are working on also in this EU projects, which I showed like the eight path project, there was the focus on what we call next generation digital pathology, which has the focus on analysis. 
And uh, we see that now uh, also pathology departments worldwide slowly move in this direction. It's no more sufficient that the uh, slides are scanned, are available in a digital form, but also the data shall be available uh, for in a digital form in, on which the actual diagnostic has to be made. And I think this, I mean, the acceptance um, by the like, national insurance systems is probably not yet there or not fully there. Also, we as tissue diagnostics, we already have uh, sold a couple of systems into clinical routine labs, yeah? where especially in countries like in Europe or also here in Australia, where labor is very um, expensive, this becomes, and, and in fact, actually in, in, in Central Europe, we have a, a lack of pathologists. Yeah? So the need for, of pathologists increases while always less young pathologists are, are available or young people study in this, in this direction. So we have a deficit um, in pathologists. Well, all the pathologists retire and less young pathologists are available. This has to be complemented by uh, computer-assisted diagnostics. And at, at some point uh, soon, I think is, is not too far in the future, um, this will also be accepted by the social insurance systems and can be compensated. So in, in Vienna, for example, we already um, have clients, uh, hospitals working on this system in, in routine pathology. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Rupert. I mean, I was also wondering, you know, uh, training, uh, you know, uh, the people efficiently is also, you know, uh, one of one of the, you know, uh, important concerns over here. I mean, uh, let me be, you know, a bit modest. You know, uh, I cannot see, you know, such pro uh, such technologies probably, you know, prevailing in India uh, at least, you know, uh, five or six years down the line. Uh, do you do you see that, you know? Uh, you know would probably solve the purpose in bridging this gap and uh, and, and given these particular standards uh, how pivotal how important would it be uh, if this particular data is integrated with electronic health records a person probably you know, sitting in India uh, can muster the support of this particular technology looking into these histopathological specimens somewhere remotely and come up with you know a kind of a analytics yeah this, this is a, uh, thank you, Prash, this is a very uh, good and important point. Um, but I, my last answer regarding cost is only one part of the story. The other part of the story is increasing the quality, right? As we have seen, uh, the results obtained by estimation um, show a wide variability. And um, especially when you have an, a great low burden, a diagnostic burden, then still telepathology is was you know getting a second opinion from second or third tier hospitals from the centers from the big centers this is one option but um, having a computer assisted uh, diagnostic could kind of replace the second opinion right because when you when you um, can use quantitative and observer independent data, of course, using systems that are certified, no? go, go through clinical study and through something like FDA approval. Yeah? This will also reduce the need for second opinions or moving samples from um, like rural areas to the big centers be it really moving them physically by sending the tissue sections or the slides there, uh, or also the, um, by, by using telepathology. I mean, internet is getting better and better, but uh, those images, as we have seen, are really huge. Yeah? So a, a gigabyte is not much yeah, here. And especially in rural areas, we still see we have problems uh, that the bandwidth, the internet bandwidth, is not available or not sufficient um, to really support um, 
such an analysis which requires high resolution images yeah, of, of full virtual slides. So this is the second aspect that is essential um, to such a next generation digital pathology. It's not only saving costs, but also increasing um, the quality of the data and bridging, third, bridging the gap uh, between centralized high level diagnostics and more as a second, third tier hospitals, which cannot afford to have maybe a trained neuropathologist or something like this. Yeah, hi, Rupert, myself, uh, uh, Dr. Niaz. Am I, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. OK, so first of all, I would like to thank you for your insight and in detail presentation uh, on imaging and, you know, beautifully covered almost all area that we are looking for, you know. So let me check quickly if there is any question in the chat box or I'll, I'll just ask a very, you know, uh, basic uh, information from your end uh, related to uh, tissue gnostics. That is, uh, I think, your company itself. I guess. Hello. Hello, I'm audible. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, as far as this range of products uh, that is there on the website, uh, I just wanted to know in detail uh, about personalized medicine, you know, tissue constrict measures contribute, contribute to a dossier. So uh, yes. do, do we have a customer in India as well related to this particular area? Um, to be very frank, no, we are just moving into uh, the Indian market. Yeah. Okay. So, so is, is there any any representative uh, uh, from your end to uh, for the Indian market? Uh, we are just we are just negotiating with a company in India, a collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, um, mm -hmm. This is done by our subsidiary Tissue Gnostics Asia Pacific, which I mm -hmm. said is is uh, located in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And um, but negotiations are not yet finished. But as soon as they are finished, this uh, the Indian company with whom we are talking or with which we are talking will also be listed on our website. So uh, by what time uh, will we able to see that information? Uh, the local representative from uh, uh, I, I would expect within a few weeks. You know? Okay, because I can see a lot of potential for a product range that is available on your website uh, yeah. mainly related to uh, this uh, if, uh, if you if know you can, yeah please if you can drop me an email sure you, you, i think you still see my email address on the shared screen rupert.ekartishnostics.com yeah, yeah i will be happy to forward this to my team in in uh, asia pacific and maybe they can maybe already help you now or at mm -hmm. least uh, notify you once uh, once uh, we have closed the contract with the Indian company. Okay, so I'm I'm sure you are aware about one company that is called Incel DX from USA. Uh, Incel DX they, it's a flow cytometry based uh, uh, solution that they are giving for uh, cancer cervix screening in low resource setting, mm -hmm. uh, where HPV infected cells. Uh, can be, you know, categorized beautifully and it will be very useful uh, from clinical uh, prospects. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure whether uh, your company is working in that area because we can see there's a lot of potential uh, for the screening of cancer cervix using this imaging system in India as well. So uh, are you working on those areas as well where uh, you can screen those HPV infected cancer cells uh, in developing countries or in Indian population? I, as I said, we have now almost 1,700 publications. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I do not know all of them. Okay. But um, if, if uh, you go to our website and, mm -hmm. and this, the, the database, the list of reference papers is in a searchable database. So we can look, mm -hmm. for example, for HPV or for screening or whatever and see who has already published what. So there is there is no specific instrument, mm -hmm. uh, but actually our, our tissue cytometry platform 
is uh, can be applied to all kind of questions, markers, and cells. Right? It's like a flow mm -hmm. cytometer. Mm -hmm. You can analyze any type of cell in, with any type of marker. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not restricted to specific questions or um, markers or cell types. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. Thank you so much. We'll be uh, sure in, in in touch with you and. Uh, through email or you know uh, it, it's yeah, wonderful I'd be happy to. yeah it's really wonderful to have you as a expert for today's uh, discussion on the gcci uh, board and it's uh, managed well by uh, prashant and sunil uh, i'm really thankful to all of you thank thanks a lot thank you very much for your appreciative words and i'll, I'll be happy to be in contact with you sure Thank you very much, uh, Rupert. So it's uh, 7.45 in Brisbane time uh, for Rupert. It, it's his dinner time. Uh, we should not probably you know, bother him much, but it's an excellent talk. Thank you so much, Rupert, you know, for your wonderful uh, uh, talk. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And feel free to contact me anytime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. You too. A big round of applause. Yeah, thank you.